took another week this week and came to the church without my computer and uh, left it at home and uh, intentionally sort of left it sitting there and, and uh, came to work with just my books and my Bible and, and uh, got out the material I'm using to sort of work through my sermon for the, for, for, for the sermon series I'm working on here on getting to know Jesus, getting to know God. And uh, when I did that, one of the, it, it, it came clear to me that one of our tasks as a Christian is to see our world like God sees it. Um, is that we need to see those around us, we need to see the things around us like God does. It means we have to see our jobs like He sees it. It means we have to see our recreation like He sees it. It means that we need to see our friends like He sees them. It means that we need to see ourselves like He sees us. And then, as I came to that point, I stumbled across a, a, a psalm that sort of hit my heart. A psalm that I must have read many times before, but this week it found a point, found a place in my heart that it had not done so before. Psalm number 32. Psalm 32. And it's going to become actually the text, a little bit different than we've been doing the last few weeks, but it's actually going to be the text of our sermon this morning. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, a psalm of David. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groanings all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me from, with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Not, do not be like the horse or the mule, which having no understanding must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they, may, they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all of you who are upright in heart. Precious Jesus, we ask that you would come this morning. That you would open all of our hearts, open our minds, our souls, our beings, that we could hear what you have to say to us. And that perhaps we can begin to see ourselves like you see us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, the history of the psalm isn't really clear. There, there were some writers that um, think that Psalm 32 we just read really came out of David's desire to respond to his sin with Bathsheba and asking for forgiveness and his response to that. Um, however, Psalm 51 very clearly says that was his response to, 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 to his sin with Bathsheba. And he doesn't label this one that way, so we aren't sure when it was written. It may have been written during the time that he was roaming in the, in, in the, the desert, in the open fields, trying to escape King Saul. And um, as, he had, as he had time to think and pose and, and wonder about what God was all about, and he may have written this psalm. But regardless... It's obviously written by a man. It's regardless written by a man who had grown to appreciate that God sees him as he really is. God sees the good, the bad, the ugly, and he accepts us as we are. And David learned that, so can we. Psalm 32 provides five 
point of an argument, if you would, for opening ourselves to see ourselves as God sees us. And the first point is that he starts out the psalm by, by stating his plan. He, he, God's plan is stated. He begins by saying, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit. Uh, forgiveness it doesn't mean we haven't sinned. In fact, forgiveness by its very nature means that we have sinned, that we have fallen short, that we have missed the mark. That we've done those things that we know we ought not to do. It doesn't mean that sin's not forgotten, but it means that it's not held against us. When I was a little kid, um, I remember when I was eight, nine years old, and we used to dye Easter eggs. And you may remember that when you were a child as well. Uh, got out little cups, and we put dye, and you had the red dye, and the blue dye, and the yellow dye, and the green dye. And you'd boil the eggs in the afternoon, so they, and they had to give them a chance to cool off before they, uh, before you started dyeing them. And you dip in the dye, and if all went well, you take this little thing with a big hole in it and dip the egg in the dye and it would be only the egg that got the color and yet you pull it out and it looks pretty this maybe add to put the let's put blue and yellow together so we go and take the then dip it in the, in the blue and after pick up the yellow we only get green on part of it and, and yeah it's very pretty and you put it aside and if all goes well it's only the egg that gets the color but you got to realize I'm an eight-year-old boy third grade and what does a third grader want to do? He wants to see what that green dye does to his finger. And so he sticks it in the, in the, in the green dye, and takes the other finger and sticks it in the red, and another one in the blue, and the other one into the yellow. And Look at Mommy, my colored fingers! And all of a sudden, Mom gets all upset, and she takes you and tries running them over the water and get the color off your fingers. And Of course, this is the date night before Easter, so you go to school go to church on Easter Sunday with blue, red, yellow, and green fingers. And, uh, but yet, you know, I get to church. You remember those, those times, Bob? You don't remember kids getting their fingers all dyed? I was a little child. So oh, okay. And, and your kids didn't get dye on their fingers. No. <laughs> and and we, got, we got this dye on our fingers, and, and it wouldn't come off. I was stained. But when I got to church the next morning, even with the stain, people would treat me just the way I was, as if I'd never gotten stained, as if I'd never gotten dirty. You know, that's the way God treats us. We're still stained. The stain is still there. There's still an effect of sin. It still has its impact on our lives. The red, the blue, the green, the yellow, like that dye is still there. But God takes us and loves us just as if we'd never sinned. God states His plan in verses 1 and 2. In verses 3 through 5, God's plan is applied. Um, I'm a scholar. Sandra, you're half a scholar. And when you're working with students or writing papers and you make a point in a paper, you have to document it. You have to tell where did, what's the source of your information. And, and David wants to tell us the source of his information. And the source of David's information is his own life. When I kept silent, David writes, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. David makes three very distinct points. He first of all uh, recognizes that sin has consequences, both physical and spiritual. Uh, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. My, your hand, there's spiritual consequences. Your hand was heavy upon me. The mental, my strength was zapped as in the heat of summer. And I understand that. I mean, with, with my MS that we've talked about, one of, the, one of the characteristics of MS is when you uh, have MS and it gets warm, your, your strength just goes away. You, you feel like doing nothing. 
And I can understand that. And then the third point he makes is that confession leads to forgiveness. Um, I think Ronald Reagan, one of our, one, probably the, the most respected presidents of the previous century, put his Second Chronicles seven fourteen in his his uh, address when he was sworn in as president. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. It's a principle that's not only true for nations, as Ronald Reagan represented, but it's also a sin that's true for people as well. If we'll confess our sins, He'll hear us, He'll forgive us, and He'll heal us. God's plan is stated. God's plan is applied. And David also says, this wasn't only for me, because God's plan is then offered in verses 6 and 7. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the water, mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Yeah, I suppose there's a number of ways to respond to an invitation. Oscar Wilde used to tell the story of an aunt of his. Oscar Wilde was an author, uh, a playwright, and uh, he uh, tells the story of an aunt that he had at one point uh, that she had planned a grand ball, you know, all the hoopla and all the pomp and all of the decorations and had the, the, or, the, the, the small uh, string orchestra ready to play. And she planned this wonderful ball and nobody showed up. Absolutely nobody came. And she died not knowing that she had never mailed the invitations. And... Uh, in the meantime, that's not the way God does. He's given us an invitation. He's given us an invitation. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Um, Sir Leonard Wood, or Leonard Wood, he was a soldier, a U.S. soldier, not a, not a, not a knight in the British government, but, but he, he, was, he, he was a U.S. soldier, and he had been invited to, to visit uh, the king of France. And he had sort of stumbled across him the day before and, and uh, he uh, had a good conversation and the king of France was, was, was very much admired this, this soldier, U.S. soldier. There's actually a United States fort named after him, uh, Fort Leonard Wood. But he uh, got an invitation to come to dinner the next day and he had not replied. He, he uh, and when he showed up for dinner, the uh, the king said, well, why are you here? How can you be here? And then, then I guess, well, didn't you invite me? And the king said, yeah, but you didn't answer my invitation. And then Leonard Wood said, a king's invitation is never to be answered. It's to be obeyed. We got the invitation, David writes, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found, we must obey the key. God's plan defended. Number four, God's plan defended. Why in the world should we do all this? The first, he, he's, he's told us, he, he's taken the plan, he's told us how it's applied in his life, he's invited us to take part, and then he finally tells us why we should do it. I will instruct you and teach you, verses 8 through 10, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Um, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, going into World War I, um, had a, it was a difficult time. You know, how, how do we interact with all these other nations? The, the World War I is way over the other side of the Atlantic. It doesn't involve us. But yet, at some point, he had to make some decisions. And so he arrived at the cabinet meeting that afternoon. And he looked solemn. He looked serious. And as he did, he, he, he said, I don't know what you men believe in prayer. I don't know whether you men believe in prayer or not. But I do, he said. And let us pray and ask the God, 
ask the help of God. And so the President of the United States got on his knees, the cabinet got on their knees, and, and began to pray and ask the Almighty for help. He had learned to turn things over to God when things got tough. It's a lesson that we too can learn. We can let God see us as we are because He accepts us the way we are and He'll instruct us and teach us in the way we should go and He'll counsel us and watch over us. And then finally, the last part of this passage of Psalm 32 gives us a response. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all of you who are upright in heart. And it seems that we maybe should conclude the sermon, not me, but we should conclude the sermon by singing our final hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.